Isaiah chapter 13 and uh, verse number 1. The Bible said, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth from the supper, laid aside his garments, and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter. Peter said unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? And Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know it hereafter. Peter said unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said unto him, He that is washed needeth not, save to wash his feet, but he is clean every whit. And you are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him. Therefore he said, You are not all clean. So after he had washed their feet, and taken his garments, and was sat down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done unto you. Praise God. This little story here, uh, a parable story, whatever you want to call it. Some people call them parables. Some people call them stories. It's a real happening. It really happened. There really was a man named Jesus. He really did have this last supper with his disciples. He really did sit down and wash their feet and, uh, and, and washed all of their feet. And, and he being girded with a towel, the Bible said, and began to wash their feet. Amen. I want to talk to you about that tonight if the Lord would help me. We're living in a time in our world, in our church world, in the economy of the church, in the, in the social standings of the church that uh, seem like a lot of people are concerned with titles. They want to, they want to be something. They've got to have something ahead of their name. And we've got MDs and PhDs and DDs and, and uh, all kinds of Ds behind everybody's got a, something behind their name or in front of them. They've got a title. Everybody wants to be, I'm Dr. So-and-so or I'm Reverend So-and-so or I'm Pastor So-and-so. Even had a man a little while back introduce himself to me as Apostle, whatever his name was. I'm Apostle So-and-so. I said, well, great. He said, are you an apostle? I said, well, I guess I'm doing what they did. And I'm preaching the apostolic doctrine, so I guess I am an apostle. He introduced himself as such. A man just a few days ago sent me a message and, and uh, was, was laughing about a particular preacher that every time he, every time he talks to me about this is Pastor So-and-so from this town, this place. Everybody wants to have a title. It's not good enough anymore to just be brother so-and-so or, 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 or even just be called by your name. People want to have a title. And uh, we read in the book of Mark, chapter number 10, where James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came into Jesus and they asked him, said, want you to give us something. We got a request we want to make. want you to grant our wish to us. And Jesus said, okay, what do you want? He said, one of us will sit on the right hand, one of us will sit on the left hand. When you come into your glory, I want to be there to receive part of that glory. I want to sit near to you. Amen. I was in a fellowship meeting probably, uh, I don't know, 25 years ago, maybe well, probably 30 years ago now. I was in a fellowship meeting and I heard a preacher preaching, testifying back in the back of this meeting. Pastor that was MC in the service had called on him. He stood to testify. He went into a big elaborate testimony about what all God had called him to do. And he said, the Lord has assured me and I'll sit on the right hand of Jesus and John the Baptist on the left when we get into the kingdom of God. Well, he's dead and gone now. I don't know whether he's sitting on a stump, a stool, or a golden throne. But nobody knows where they're going. Jesus said, that's not mine to give. I can't give you that right to sit in this chair. I can't give you that kind of honor. They wanted a title. It's always worried about who's the greatest among us. Jesus no, told them. He said, can you drink the drink I drink? Can you be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? He said, if you want to sit with me, you're going to have to work with me. You're going to have to serve with me. You're going to have to labor my vineyard. If you can't do that, then you're none of mine. We can go 
in the book of Matthew chapter number 18, we read the disciples coming to Jesus and asking him, hey, Lord, who's the greatest among us? Who's the best? That's how we react to things so many times. I had a preacher friend that uh, some years ago backslid, left out, you know, went in the ways of all the earth. The survival said, left the holiness people in. He, uh, he used to call me every once in a while, especially around summertime. He'd call me. He'd ask me, who's on the top three list? Who's the top five? Who's this? Who's that? Who's going to preach the most meetings? Who's going to do this? Who's going to do that? I heard him and some other preachers get together in fellowship meetings and camp meetings and then start in. So and so's the top this year. This is the evangelist of the hour. This is that. All of these titles. That's what the disciples were doing. And when they asked Jesus, said, who's the greatest among us? Jesus got a little bitty child and set him out there. And he said, except you become as little children, you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And Jesus, Jesus constantly tried to get people to look away from the titles that man puts on things and just be a servant to the Lord. Help yes. us, Jesus. Disciples were constantly worried about titles, worried about who's the best, who's going to do this, who's going to do that, who gets to call this, who gets that name, who gets that name. Amen. James tells us in the second chapter of his book, he said, if a man comes into our presence in gay clothing, amen, nice raiment, and you tell him, come set up here. And then a man comes in in vile raiment, and he's poor. And you tell him, you stay back there in the back. You can't come up here. You've got respect to persons. He tells us in the Word of God, whoever has respect to persons commit a sin. There is no respect to persons with God. Amen. God holds all the titles. He, Help I mean, you, know, Jesus. you know how it is. You read the storybooks. I was a little boy. Of course, I like to play cowboys and Indians. Mostly cowboys. I don't guess I ever wanted to be sitting bull or crazy horse. <laughs> I, I, had, I wanted to be the cowboy. I like to play that. I like to read those books, you know, about uh, the cowboys and about Billy the Kid and, and about, uh, you know, Bat, Bat Masterson and all these old timers, Wyatt Earp, people like that. And no matter how fast you can get a gun out of the holster, it's always somebody faster comes along in a little while and you end up on Boot Hill. He's the fastest gun in the West, but not for long. Amen. Goes down through time and everything. Get a book of world records and the title changes. He got the heavyweight champion of the world and the lightweight champion of the world. Amen. Go all the way down to it in sports. Who's the best? Amen. Who's the greatest quarterback? Who's the greatest fullback? Who's the greatest that can put up the, the ball Jesus. into the net? And make the best uh, amen, the best of slam dunks in the net. Amen. I tell you, it's always some kind of a title. Uh, but it doesn't last forever. Somebody comes along uh, and then you got a brand new one holding the title. Help him, God. There's a few men over the years that, uh, you know, have stood out in certain types of athletic things. Babe Ruth, you know, I've heard of him. Read a little about him. He struck out, of course, way more times than he hit home runs. And, uh, and that just, you know, it isn't my thing. I don't know anything hardly about sports. I know Michael Jordan was something pretty important in basketball. I really don't know what all he did, but I know he's something pretty important. I know there's two guys fighting one day in a ring, boxing, one of them bit the other in zero. I mean, they ended up with a brand new champion after a while. Praise God, I'm telling you, titles come and titles go. I've watched churches before. One man told me one time, I said, how come you don't have your, uh, they had a church sign like ours, had a little uh, a clippy underneath it with a board and said, pastor's name so-and-so. We'd come around one time preaching, and that little board was tucked down. And I asked the man, I said, what happened to all that? Uh, what, uh, where's, the, where's, the, where's the rest of the sign? He said, well, we've been changing pastors around here so often. He said, it's costing us so much money buying new letters or having everything painted over. He said, we just finally took that part off. And it wasn't just a day or two ago, somebody told me they took the whole sign down. Finally, they changed church nights because this pastor wants it now. Another pastor wants it on this night. Somebody else wants it. I'm telling you, titles change. But I want to know what is God interested in. He's not interested in us carrying around a bunch of titles. He's looking for somebody that will gird themselves with a title. Of servitude and say, I don't care what title you give me, I don't care what you think about my name, I just want to be a servant to the Lord. Amen. Titles change, people change. I uh, remember being a boy and, and Lane Frost and Rose Bull, and uh, I, I liked that kind of stuff a whole lot more than I did ball. 
And uh, I've never been to a rodeo in my life. I've never been to a ball game in my life. I've only been to one ball game. Amen. The pastor sent me to get his girls to skip church and went to a ball game. I went to the door of the basketball homecoming and knocked on the door. And you know, finally somebody came and answered it. And I told the school teacher that answered it, go get me so and so and so and so. Their dad said, get out of there and get to church out. She said, well, come in here and find them. I said, nope, I'm a homeless preacher and they don't go to places like this. That's the nearest I've ever come to a ball game. Lane Frost had rode a bull, amen, and got out there and he, and he got stepped on, got squished, and after a while they come, somebody else come along. Tough Hedeman was a great bull rider, great man in the rodeo for a long time. And then come along, and before that was Freckles Brown, way back when. My little nephew Trace, he's got a he's got a bull that he likes to sleep with. Got big long horns, those stuffed animal, and he likes to play. So I don't even know who it is now, but so and so that he likes to play. That I'm so and so. I'm this bull rider. Titles change. I tell you, water in the house of God. It doesn't matter who the deacon is. It don't matter who the song leader is. It don't matter who's playing the instrument. I want to gird myself in a towel. And be ready to serve God in that moment of notice. I want to lay down the title and pick up the towel and say yes to God. Yes. Help him, Jesus. And Brianna help me today. Brought me this, got me this little trophy here. You know, everybody wants to win something. When I was in school, you didn't get participation ribbons. When I was in school, if you lost the race, you just lost. That's all there was to it. You just sucked it up and went on about your business and tried not to be a ball bag about it. Nowadays, everybody gets a ribbon, no matter who it is. Hey, man, that wasn't the way it was when I was in school. If you won the trophy, you was the winner. You didn't get one down here in a little letter that said participant on the bottom of it. Either you was the winner or you was the loser. Yes. yes. Still the way it ought to be. Help him. That, that won't cost you anything. That's true. Children need to be taught that sometimes you lose. Everybody's not a winner. Some people are duds. Some people are zeros. And kids need to know that. That if you don't come in first, you're not a winner. You're the loser. That's right. We've got a whole society of folks, Brother Junior, that want to go around with their trophy. I'm, I'm, I'm pastor so-and-so over here. This is what I do. I'm, I do this. I'm, I, I play the piano. I'm the song leader. I'm the Sunday school teacher. I do this with the young people. I do that with the young people. And I'll tell you what, it ends up with before it's over. Everybody's walking around with their little trophy and their little title. I'm this. I'm that. And here we got Jesus who held the all-time title. Who's a God like unto our God. Who is a Lord like unto our Lord. Wherefore it had pleased God to highly exalt Him and had given Him a name. That is above every name that's named. At the name of Jesus, every knee would bow down. He'd be called Wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. I'm telling you, of His kingdom, there'll be no end. He holds the title, and yet, being the Lord of all, He picked up a towel, laid aside all of His kingliness, and He girds Himself with a towel, and He goes to wash in the feet of those disciples. Amen, fishermen, tax collectors. So nobody, so even a devil like Judas got his feet washed. Yes. You hear me? I don't mind serving long time. I have to serve so and so. Help him, Jesus. I don't mind working. I'm not going to work for so and so. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. I don't like that guy. I don't like that woman. I'm telling you, that kind of stuff has no place in the kingdom of God. Amen. Those kind of attitudes have no place in the kingdom of God. The attitude that if so-and-so testifies, I will not get in. If somebody else stands up and says, let's all raise our hands and praise the Lord. Oh, you just have your little spell over there. Amen. But if it's this woman over here, I'm not getting in with that. Amen. If it's sin, I can understand. I'm telling you, when it comes to pet peeves and petty little foolishness and schisms, those things have no place in the kingdom of God. God is looking for men and women, boys and girls, that'll pick up a towel. Amen. I don't have to be out front. Ain't you know why a lot of people will never get a blessing? You know why? So, so I give and give and give and give. I put $5,000 in that offer and I put $2,000 in that offer and I give $100 to that old lady over there. You know why some people say I give and give and give and I don't ever get a blessing? Because they do it to be seen in men. Yep. Some people won't write a check and put it in the offer unless they're on the front row and everybody else can see them write the check and then they spend 45 minutes tearing it out. <laughs> Finally get it tore out. <laughs> Blow on the ink. Fold it up and then press down and lay that thing in the offering pan so everybody can see them and then go back to their seat fluttering their little angel wing and wonder then why God don't 
bless me when I get. That's not what he said. He said, do not thy arms before men to be seen of men. But he said, if you do those things in secret, your father would see it in secret. He'll reward you openly. And then it's not about who gets called on to sing. It's not about who testifies the best. It's about the town servitude. Help him, Jesus. Serving God. Man, everybody. Get, Bless him, Lord. Since, since there's not a bunch of preachers here, I'll, I'll pick on them, okay? I am one. So I'm sure you know probably what I think about preachers. Don't ask me about all of them because i got some opinions on some. But, but I'll tell you, I love preachers. I'd probably count on, I'd probably put that hand in a lawnmower with a blade on and come out with enough fingers to count and tell you how many services I've ever been in that I just wish to goodness I had never been in that service. I've had to spit some cob out a few times. I've heard some things I, you know, I just spit it out. I ain't gonna walk out, I didn't throw a fit. But I've managed to get some good out of about every message I've ever heard preached. I've heard some boring junk. Amen. I've heard stuff preached on that I did just as soon, oh yeah. Amen. I mean, bunch of garbage. I've heard ignorance. People get up and preach, you know, slap in the pulpit, sweat and scream and holler, act like they're in the spirit. You know, everybody wants to be a preacher. I want to be a preacher. I want a truck and a trailer that's two miles long. I want a, I want a, 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 a book where I got to schedule all my revivals and I can't even hardly hold up. I go to camp meetings and I, I know a man that way. He'd come in a camp meeting, flip the big old book out, great big old thing, and start flipping the pages. And he looked over at some of us and said, Are you boys scheduled up? Hey man, what do you got going on? You know, hey man, strutting around there acting like it's the best thing that ever come down the pike. Hey man, Sister Carolyn, there's a preacher across from me. And that guy asked him, said, Are you scheduled up till whatever date it was? And he just kind of grunted at him. He asked me, I kind of grunted. I'm just all said and done. I think he had about two revivals between June and the end of the year. I was booked up all the way till sometime in the next year. And the other preacher was booked up three years in a row. And then the guy said, I don't know how to do that. What do you guys do? It certainly isn't that I'm such a great preacher. And that everybody wants to be at the top of it. And that there's a nursing home that needs God. a minister. There's somebody that's sick that needs a pie cooked for him. And then there's somebody that needs a text message. And let them know you're praying for him. Everybody can preach a camp meeting. But everybody can take up the towel of servitude and do something for the Lord. I mean, they're having camp meeting at Fairland. The Lord will be willing. We're going to go tomorrow night to camp meeting. You know, they didn't ask me to preach that thing. You believe that? <laughs> they never asked me, Brother Junior. I mean, I want them to go. That, that Lloyd Shoecraft, the nerve of that guy. He didn't ask me to preach his camp meeting. I'm not going. I know people just like that. I'm not kidding you. I know people that same way. I'm not going down there. They didn't ask me. I'm not going. Or they go to camp meeting, you know, they're only going to have one night speaker. I mean, they're going to have a different one every night, but even then you're just going to have four or five. But you're going to shout a night or two. You don't even need a week's worth. They got Ryan Ralston and, and uh, Bill Prescott, brother Ryan Ralston, brother Bill Prescott, preach that meeting. You believe that? I'm going to go listen to them. And I guarantee you by the time church is over tomorrow night, I'll have heard something that Brother Ralston puts out over that pulpit that'll bless me. I'll have heard something Brother Preston puts out and whoever else preaches in the service that'll bless me. But only so many can preach. Only so many can sing. You think my wife's going to go down there and throw a big old fit, sit back there with their arms folded and their lip pooched out because they didn't ask her to get up and sing a special on Friday night at a camp meeting with 700, 800 people in it? No. Amen. I'm telling you tonight, if you want to serve God, there's a place for you in the kingdom of the Lord. It may not be a title. It may just be an old towel. It may just be that you call people up and say, I'm praying for you. It might just be you knock on somebody's door and hand them a bowl of soup when you're sick. What about the ministry, brother? It's not all about pulpits and titles. It's about the town. It's about serving God in a heart of servitude. Yes, amen. Praise God. The Bible said like this concerning, I believe it was the house of Stephanus, that they had addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. They had addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. You say, Brother really Justin, I don't sing. I don't play an instrument. I can't even clap in time with the music. That's okay. 
He said, all I can do is write cards to people that are down and discouraged. If that's all you can do, use your best penmanship when you write it. It's for the Lord. That's right. Do you want to be a servant? Do you want a title? Are you willing to take a towel? Jesus said, let he that is greatest among you become servant of all. Let him that is the servant be exalted up. Listen to me. Don't exalt yourself. Don't fight over title. And, and, and look here. I prayed about this this week. I knelt down this afternoon, sought the Lord again. I said, God, you do remember where I'm going to be preaching tonight, don't you? I don't really think that we have an immense problem with, you know, pride and people fighting over the pulpit. Saying, I don't think we have that issue. I felt like preaching to us tonight, Thursday night. We got a lot of folks here and there, yonder, sick. Got various things going on. I understand that. I felt like preaching to you tonight. God's not looking for the best singer. God's not looking for the best preacher. God's looking for somebody that's available to wear the towel of servitude. I'm not washing my feet. I'm not doing that. I mean, if you want me to, you know, if, if you'd like me to speak on Sunday, I'll be happy to do that. I ain't getting out of my hands and he's washing nobody's or grimy feet. Jesus did. Yes. He Keep did. in mind, he washed the feet of the man who was fixing to sell him to the executioner. Yes. He washed his feet just like he did Peter's. He said, I'll wash their feet, but I'm going to crack every toe bone they got while I'm doing it. Because I don't want them. And that's not the right attitude. If we want to go somewhere with God, we're going to make it with a towel girded around us just like Jesus did. If the man that made the world, you remember that, Concerning Christ, without him was not anything made that is made. The guy that made it all put on a towel and washed the dirty, dusty feet yes. of his disciples. He willingly laid down his kingly robes. He willingly became a man. He became the servant of all. Aren't you glad for him tonight? Yes. I'm glad he was willing to wear the towel. I'm glad he wasn't all about the title. I got, I'm Jesus. I'm Jesus. I don't have to do that. I'm the Son of God. I don't have to do that. You know what you know who my father is? Have, anybody, have, you, have you ever met him? Have you ever heard about him? See my title? Look here. Look at that. I'm Jesus, for goodness sakes. I'm not washing your feet. Get up. I'm not going into your grimy house, Mr. Centurion, praying for your kid. I'm not touching that dead body. Some old widow woman's son. My goodness, you just used to get over it. Go get on a widow's pension. Get on, go down and get on, you know, get on welfare, whatever. I'm, I'm Jesus. I don't have to do that. He wasn't that way. He was willing to sit down with the woman at the well that had five husbands too many. Yes. Remember? Somebody said that here some time ago preaching somewhere. Somebody said, she just had five. I said, no. She said, I have had five. And Jesus said, the one you're with now ain't yours. So she had six. She was on her sixth one. He went and sat down and talked to that woman and cared about her. He went out of his way just for that woman. Yes. He went out of his way and stopped the whole parade because one widow woman was crying. And he raised her son from the dead. Yes. I'll tell you what he done. He stopped it all one day for me. He stopped it for blind Bartimaeus. He stopped it for Jairus. He stopped it for the woman that's all bowed over for 18 years and could in no wise straighten herself up. Brother and sister, you wouldn't have nothing tonight if he hadn't stopped what he was doing and put a towel on to reach for you. Yes, I'm glad he reached for me. Yes. He didn't just do it because I was so worthy. He didn't do it because he thought I was going to be the greatest preacher that ever wore a pair of shoes on the earth. He got it because he loved me. Yes. Yes. I'm a servant. You say, well, you're the pastor of the church. You get to carry all that honor. Yeah, it's great, ain't it? Have you checked into it lately? You know, they don't have preachers come and do job fairs at the public school. You know, come on. What do you want to be for the rest of your life? A preacher. I'm going to be a preacher. I'm going to hack my lungs out three times a week. Pray all night long. Listen to people's problems. And, you know, that's not what you do. I'll tell you what being a preacher is. It ain't no title goes with it. It's a towel of servitude. It's being willing to listen when Brother Junior's sick. Listen when Sister Debbie's sick. Listen when Sister Gail's got a problem. Listen when Sister Jean's got a problem. It ain't all about, well, I'm the pastor. Don't be calling me in the middle of the night for prayer. I don't care about your problems. You go work that out yourself. You put the towel on. And it don't matter if it's 2 in the morning, 3 in the morning, or 12 in the afternoon. You get on your face and you go to pray because you're a servant. Brother, I'm telling you to serve God. That's what he's interested in. He's wanting servants. He's wanting people that'll grab a towel and head for the vineyard and say, what can yes. I do? Find me something to do. You want God to be Help there when you God. Need. You want God to be there when your children's sick. You want God to be there every time your tear falls. Put a towel on and start being a servant. Yes, that's right. 
Lord. Help him, Jesus. I don't know if Brother Morris Brown ever preached a revival. I never knew of it if he did. I don't know if he ever preached a camp meeting or even preached in a camp meeting. Just a little bitty guy, a little tiny man, and uh, very slight built. He wasn't, a, he wasn't an outstanding pulpiteer. He wasn't the kind of guy who probably ever had his name in the holiness messenger. He's preaching this meeting and that meeting. I tell you what, to a struggling pastor on a Thursday night, on a cold winter night, when I didn't have a message to preach, the Bible didn't have one in it, and our church was barely holding together down there in Stroud, Oklahoma, and I walked out of my little study where I'd been praying over a five-gallon paint bucket. I walked out and there sitting Brother Morris and Sister Katie and Kent. And Brother Morris saw me coming, tears running. And he said, son, I don't want to be in your way, but I really felt like coming tonight. I really felt like God gave me a message. I said, Brother Morris, you're on the docket. You're up tonight. No questions asked. That little man stood up there, tears streamed down his face. Amen. He didn't preach anything awe-inspiring. He didn't wade off in the net deep theology. I'm telling you, he brought us an encouraging word from the Lord. I watched that man walk into the prison down there at Bowling. And I went to prison service with him. I'm telling you, those prisoners in there in their orange jumpsuits, uh, they acted towards him like people acted when Hamas Crawford walked on a campground. Uh, or when Don Rich walked on a campground. No, Brother Morris Brown didn't preach any of our camp meetings. Uh, I'm Help telling you, he wore a towel. Uh, he said, I'll serve God in the prison. Uh, I'll serve God in the nursing Help home. Help uh, hey, me, Brother, I'm telling you, God is looking uh, for somebody to wear a towel. Yes, he is. I thought about Brother Herbert Tilly this week. He was like that. It didn't, he didn't do anything great as far as preaching meetings, revivals. I don't guess ever pastor the church. I think Brother Tilly had four or five nursing home services a week for years, years and years and years. Preached to those elderly people in rest homes. Hey man, I've heard young preachers say, well, I want to be a preacher, but I ain't preaching down there. I heard a boy one time at the Bible school. He said, I ain't preaching about your old people don't know if it's night or day, slobbering on their self and mumbling out of their head. I told him, I said, oh. I heard it. I whirled around. I said, what'd you say? He repeated it again. I said, you listen to me. Then people are spending eternity just as long as the kings are and just as long as the presidents are. I said, brother, I'm telling you something today. You get in there and preach to those old people. They're standing there fixing to go meet the king. And if the best thing you can do is serve God and help them finish well, then so be it. Yes, it's right. It's not all about what you do in public. Are you wearing a towel? Or are you carrying around a trophy and tie? <coughs> I want to serve the Lord, don't you? Yes. I've known people over the years. I'm going to close right here. I've known people over the years that weren't much as far as this world was concerned. Yes. They had little of this world's goods. But I tell you, they were known in the courtrooms of another world. The king knew them. Mm -hmm. The state representative didn't know them. People in the church didn't know them. But the king knew them. I heard a story told. I don't remember whether I heard Brother Ralph Campbell tell it best. I remember it. I don't remember whether it was Moody. For some reason or other, I want to think it was D.O. Moody. Whoever it was, one of the great evangelists, praying, Lord, where's my success coming from? Is it my preaching? Is it this? Is it that? He said one evening, he happened by the church late in the night and heard a sound. He said he went in, there was a simple-minded boy, handicapped child, that was praying in a little room down to the side of the rostrum. Whichever one of the preachers it was, I apologize, I can't, I can't get it in my mind just right. The preacher asked him, what are you doing, son? He said, praying for you. He said, I come every day and ask God, remember my preacher. There that man was winning hundreds to the Lord. Oh, I'm telling you, whoever it was, I can't remember this now. I mean, they write books about those guys. They write biographies. There was a little boy who probably couldn't spell, probably couldn't read or write. And he said, I'm just here to talk to Jesus for you. Brother, I'm telling you, the towel always outweighs the title. Praise God. I heard a story, and I'm closing. I told Brianna about it this afternoon. A little boy that would run in every day. Pastors around the church doing things. A little boy would run in. 
He held the altar and whispered on about his business he'd go. I always wondered what he said. The story I read, said the pastor got close enough one day and the little boy knelt down. Just knelt at the altar and he said, Jesus, this is Jimmy. I'm here. And he went on. Every day, Jesus, this is Jimmy. I'm here. He went on. They said, one day Jimmy got ran over in the street. He was gathered up and carried to the hospital. <laughs> Laying there in the room, the doctors, nurses were going to save Jimmy's life. The little story I read it said, all of a sudden, a light shined into that room. They said there was a wonderful presence that filled the hospital room he was in, that trauma center. Those nurses said we heard a voice. It said, Jesus, said, Jimmy, this is Jesus. I'm here. And that's what I'm interested in. I want him to be there when I need him. And if I am, and I want that, I gotta be there when he needs me. No matter what it is, carrying out the trash, sweeping the steps, mowing the yard, spraying the weeds, watering the flowers in the pot, picking up a piece of trash in the floor. It's for God. It's not for our glory. I don't want my name on a sign. It's not about me. Joseph Parker said that he wanted a cathedral so great that should the Queen of England come to town, she would stop and with awe would question, what is this edifice? And they would say, this is Joseph Parker's church. It's not what I'm interested in country church by the side of the road in the hills of Arkansas. I want to wear a towel. If I have to wash the disciples' feet, I'm not too proud to do so. Jesus is our pattern. Let's serve him in the whole heart. Will you stand tonight? God bless you. I know it's Thursday night. I try to not shortchange you. I'm not trying to overfeed. I know we don't have a house full. I don't know the one way to do it. Pray through and get a message from God and preach like there's a million people listening. It's all the way I know to do. I'm not looking for a title. I'm content with a towel. If Jesus wore one, by all means I ought to be able to do the same. There's a place for every one of you in the kingdom of God. Maybe things you don't feel like you can do or you can't do as good as someone else. We're not in competition. I know preachers I heard a man pastor say to another one time, he said, when I'm gone, I get so-and-so to preach. Can't preach his way out of a wet paper sack, the man said. He said, I don't want my people following all back to somebody else while I'm gone. I told Jennifer, I said, if I ain't there, I want to feed him something better than I give him. I want somebody that can preach this house down. I want somebody to get in here and feed you something worth eating if I'm not here. I'm not in, we're not in competition. It's not to try to decide if Sister Gail or Sister Debbie can play the song better. It doesn't matter. God gives you a song and you stand up singing. We can never even find your key. Sing it for God. It isn't about titles. It's about serving a master. I want to hear you say, well done, don't you? Let's come pray tonight. Seek the Lord before.